Good morning. We welcome you to our service. So glad that you're that you're here. We want to ask God's blessing on our time together. Would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you that we can come into your presence through our faith in Christ and that you hear our prayers. We thank you for your faithfulness to us over the past week. That you brought us here again to be together in your presence and we pray that everything we do in this service will give honor and glory to Christ. We pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, minister to our hearts and that um, you would inhabit our praises. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you are good and that your mercy endures forever and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. If you would, please stand and turn to number 585. Let's sing, I Must Tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles, he is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver, make of my troubles quickly an end. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Tempted and tried, I need a great Savior, one who can help my burdens to bear. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, he all my cares and sorrows will share. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus and he will help me over the world the victory to win. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Sing that chorus again without the piano. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Over just a few pages, number 589, I understand you guys sang this while I was gone. I'm sorry to repeat it a week, two weeks in a row, but it's such a good song, it's not a problem. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? 
We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still a refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a solace there. Thank you. Be seated. This time we'll worship the Lord through our giving. Darrell, would you ask God's blessing on the offering, please? This is the reading of God's word from the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And may God bless the reading of his word. Amen. I know you guys probably can't hear when the ushers pray over the offering. Uh, but Daryl Bailey said something uh, that, that really struck me. 
last prayer a few minutes ago that said, thank you for loving us when we were at our worst. And that's a, that, that's a very profound thing. The song we're about to sing uh, talks a little bit about that. And in it, we learned this song last fall. It says, Jesus said, when I thirst and when I hurt, come to him. And then in the last verse, it switches and he said, when you can't come, I'll come to you. And the more that I sing this song, the, the more deeply those words hit me. And I just wanted you to listen to them as we sing today, Jesus Strong Encounter. Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come to him. No one else can satisfy, I should come to him. Jesus said, Jesus said if I am weak, I should come to him. No one else can be my strength, I should come to him. For the Lord is good and faithful, he will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong. Jesus said that if I fear, I should come to him. No one else can be my shield, I should come to him. For the Lord is good and faithful, he will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and kind. Notice these words on this next verse. Jesus said, if I am lost, he will come to me. And he showed me on that cross, he will come to me. For the Lord is good and faithful, he will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong. Jesus strong and kind. Amen. that are hid away, I lay it all at your feet. From the corners of my deepest shame, the empty places where I've worn you lame, show me the love I say.
Thank you so much, Leah. I invite you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 3. Ephesians, chapter 3. Uh, while, while you're turning there, let me uh, talk to you just a couple of moments about our, our church services. Um, you've been passing notes during church, and I just wanted to talk. No, I'm just kidding. That's not what I wanted to talk about. Um, now, uh, we're, we're making the decision as uh, pastors. We've been in consultation with the deacons, and we're going to go back to one service. Um, we've been in this two-service model for, uh, we believe, long enough. Um, the second service, if you haven't been in the second service, the numbers are quite uh, down in that. But really, more importantly than that, um, we feel that um, we just need to be together more. We feel like the two-service uh, model, which we did out of necessity, seems like a long time ago now, uh, has run its course, and we feel like not we're not divided as a church family, but we're not as together uh, as we, we feel like we need to be, and so we've been in prayer about that and assessing it along the way, and we met recently, and we, we're deciding to go back to one uh, worship service. We're trying to meet people a little bit in the middle. It seems like that uh, most people have voted with their feet that you like an earlier start time to your church uh, day than what, what we traditionally did at Bethel, and so we've decided, though, to have Sunday school first at 9.30 and worship at 10.30. Uh, we felt it important as a leadership to try to get more people involved in Sunday school, and having that first, we believe, is the best way forward. So 
beginning in two weeks on January the 22nd. On January 22nd, we'll start Sunday school at 9.30 and have our worship service at 10.30. Uh, right now, Sunday nights are still going to be reserved for uh, having the ordinances of the Lord's Supper and washing of the saints' feet once a quarter. And then occasionally this year, we're planning on having some fellowship meals out in, out in the Family Life Center to try to build a sense of, of fellowship we feel like we've lost a little bit over the last uh, two or three years with COVID. Uh, if you have any questions about that, you'd like to talk uh, further, um, please, please feel the freedom to talk to me uh, about it or any of the other pastors or deacons, we'd love to talk to you uh, about it. But I know that, that moving forward, that you guys always ad adapt and, and get on board because we know this is bigger than any, any individual, right? And so we feel like this is the best way forward. And so I want to ask Brother Forrest, if he would, to stand and lead us in prayer just for our church moving forward and for our, our sense of unity and fellowship. Brother Forrest. Before I forget, before I get to the sermon, uh, the, the teen lock-in was, was Friday night. I, I'm told I was not there. I appreciate those that volunteered for that and lost sleep over it, but I heard a young man was saved uh, Friday night at the lock-in, so we praise the Lord for that. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse uh, 14 this morning is our text. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, we'll read through the end, or we'll actually read through verse uh, 19. I'm saving Verses 20 and 21 for next week, Lord willing. The Bible says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This is God's word. This past week on national television, I'm sure many of you witnessed it, but on national television, an NFL football player for the Buffalo Bills uh, collapsed on the football field from a sudden cardiac arrest. Within minutes, medical professionals were out on the field uh, attending to him and working on him, and it was a very moving scene to see all of his teammates gather around him, and it appeared that many of those teammates began to pray. And thank the Lord, near the end of the week, I think it was on Friday, uh, this young man had been in very serious condition. It was touch and go for a long time, but on Friday, he had improved so much throughout the week that he was able to talk to his teammates uh, via FaceTime. And so we thank the Lord for his recovery. But when something like this happens, and I know you've seen it, uh, a lot of people throughout the country uh, said they were, they were praying for him. This is uh, communicated, especially in our day, through social media. And uh, maybe one of the most, uh, the simplest way that it's communicated is through the emoji, I think that's what it's called, uh, with the, uh, the hands together, the, the praying hands. But very often, one of the phrases that you'll hear people say, either in writing or verbally, is they'll say something like, prayers up. You heard that before, the, the phrase, 
prayers up. We want to have our prayers up for this situation, in this case for that particular person. But this morning what I'm interested in is when our prayers do go up, what it, what are, what's the content of our prayers? When, when our prayers, do, we, we say we're praying, hands together, prayers up. But when our prayers actually go up, what, what are we actually saying to God? What, what is the subject matter of our prayers? Now, I want to be clear from the outset, as I talk about the content of our prayer life this morning, I want to be clear from the outset that the Bible is clear that we can pray about anything. Aren't you glad that we can pray, we can talk to God about anything? And when we talk to God about anything and everything, our prayers don't have to sound a certain way. We don't have to dress our prayers up in, quote, religious talk. Our, our prayers can be long. If, if they need to be long, our prayers can be very short. So I don't want anyone to misunderstand what I'm going to get at this morning. Our, our prayers, we can talk to God about anything, and they don't have to sound a particular way. However, having said that, what if someone took all of your prayers and they collected them all together and they started examining your prayers for the content of your prayers? Like if they looked at your prayer life and said, okay, this is what this person prays about over and over and over again, and they examined all of them. Or let me put it this way, if someone collected all of your prayers and they started examining their prayers and mine for the theology they found in your prayers. Theology is simply what we believe about God, right? And we can learn a lot about our theology by studying our prayers because our prayer life reveals what we really believe about God's nature and what we believe God can and will do. And so this morning what I would like to do is not so much examine our prayers necessarily. I want to examine a prayer here that's before us in Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to examine Paul's inspired prayer for these Ephesian believers. And the purpose this morning is not necessarily just to examine it. It is to lay it before us and to see what's there. But more so is to, is to help us learn how to pray this way. Now as we think about praying, this is a model for us, I believe, in Ephesians chapter 3. But as we think about this model that we're going to examine, it, the, the goal here is not to recite the prayer. Just like when Jesus gave the disciples the disciples' prayer, that's what it's more appropriately called. It's not the Lord's prayer, it's the disciples' prayer. He didn't mean for the disciples to simply recite the words. Rather, he said, "This is the, you should pray in this manner. He gave them categories for prayer, a model to follow. And the same thing is true this morning for Paul's prayer here in Ephesians chapter 3. This section of scripture, as you might remember from last week, is where Paul was headed at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 3. Remember Ephesians chapter 3, which we looked at last week, the first 13 verses. Verse 1 begins with, For this reason I, Paul, and our text this morning in verse 14 says the same thing. For this reason. And so sandwiched in between verse 1 and verse 14 is what we looked at last week where Paul talks about his suffering for the sake of the Gentiles, his ministry for these Gentile believers. And so last week we considered how he shares with them how his ministry is suffering for their sake. Now in our text this morning he shares even further. He's not only suffering for their sake, he is praying for their sake. But what is he actually praying? Well, we have it before us this morning. As he's bowing his knees before the Father, he's praying that according to, not out of, but according to his riches and glory, what will he do in the lives of these Christians? Well, essentially what Paul prays for these believers is he's praying that they would experience more of the power of the Spirit and more of the presence of Christ. He's praying that these believers would experience more of the power of the Spirit of God and the presence of Christ. Now, these are not two separate things, and I'll explain that as I move forward. But let's think this morning about praying, first of all, for more, that we would experience more of the power of the Spirit of God. That's what he says in verse uh, 16. I'm praying that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Your inner being. I like that phrase, inner being or inner man. Maybe it reminds you of what the Apostle Paul said in another place. I think it's 2 Corinthians where he said, though this, the outer man is wasting away, yet the inner man is being renewed day by day. 
Now, the older you get in life, right, can I get a witness? The older you get in life, you bear witness to the scripture is always true, but you learn it's even truer to life the older you get. When it says the outer man wastes away, can I get a witness from anyone? Yep. I don't ask for witnesses a lot, but, I, you know, there, there you go. Sometimes you have to bring your own witness as a preacher, but there, there it is. The outer man is wasting away. The Bible says, though, for the Christian, though, the inner man is being renewed day after day. The inner man is this, this inner life, the seed of the soul, the heart, the will, our thoughts, everything on the inside of us that makes us us, that's the inner man. And so Paul says here that he's praying that the Spirit of God would empower you or strengthen you in the inner man. That's what we actually need. This is where true religion resides in the inner man or the inner person. This is where real transformation must take place in our lives. We all know what it's like to conform outwardly or externally to rules and laws. Now, Some of that's important to do in life, but my point is we don't want just mere outward external obedience. We want it to spring from the core of our being, right? Sometimes in our Christian lives, if we're honest, we're like that young child who was told by his uh, parents, you know, sit down, and the toddler doesn't want to sit down, but he does anyway out of fear. But when he's sitting down, he says, I may be sitting down on the outside, but inside I'm standing up. And so we know what it's like to externally sometimes obey but it doesn't spring from our, our inner being. Paul is praying that we would be strengthened by the power of God's Spirit in the inner man. Now, let me, the Christian life isn't easy for sure. We all understand that. But perhaps we could say that in one sense it would be easier if we would learn to rely on the inner working of the Holy Spirit. Paul demonstrates that in our text because the verb that's used here is a passive verb that he would that you would be strengthened with power be strengthened with power so he's not telling us to make ourselves strong he's telling us to rely on the spirit of God's power in our lives to be strengthened of course we understand as I just mentioned this is a passive verb we understand that the Christian life is, is not entirely passive is it as we study the rest of the Bible, we understand that to grow in the grace and, and to grow in godliness, that requires our effort. It's not just going to happen. No one drifts into holiness. It involves faith and obedience in our part. As we'll see in the next phrase where Paul talks about Christ dwelling in our hearts, he says that happens through faith or our trust. But the emphasis here this morning in this first phrase where Paul is praying that the Spirit of God would strengthen us, the emphasis here is on the divine activity of God, not our activity. Left to ourselves, we are entirely weak. We are utterly helpless. But through the divine enablement of the Spirit of God, you can live out the Christian life. Some people sometimes before they meet Christ, they talk about being saved, and I appreciate their honesty, and they'll say something like, I could, I could never live the Christian life. And that's an absolutely true statement. You can never live the Christian life left to yourself. But by the power of the Spirit of God, you can live it out, right? Paul has already spoken about the power of God. Perhaps you'll remember this back in Ephesians chapter 1. We covered that several weeks ago. But also he talks about the power of God in the context of prayer in Ephesians chapter 1. Maybe you'll remember this in Ephesians 1 where he talks about he's praying that these believers would understand the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he demonstrated in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So back there in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul is saying, look, God not only has power, God has great power. God not only has power and it's great power, God's power is immeasurable. You can't put a tape measure to it. You can't fully fathom how powerful God is. The big word we would use to describe that is God is omnipotent. He is, he is all-powerful. There is nothing beyond the ability of God. There's nothing that God cannot do. There are some things that God will not do because of his character, but in terms of his strength and his might and his ability, nothing is beyond the power and strength of our God. But sometimes we live in ignorance of this this power. That's what Paul is praying here. Remember, he's praying for these Christians. I want you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Uh, I'll probably butcher this, but the great preacher uh, Adrian Rogers from uh, Memphis, Tennessee, or who pastored in Memphis for a long time, used to give an illustration similar to this. He would say, uh, you can kind of compare it like this, where maybe someone buys a new sports car. Imagine your friend 
buys a brand new sports car and it's got a souped up V8 engine you know, under the hood. This is the first car this person has ever purchased. But every, you discover that when you, you meet them on the highway, they're not actually uh, behind the wheel. They're actually they're pushing it down the highway. Occasionally, they, they get to the place where they can coast down the hill, and so they'll jump in then and get behind the steering wheel. But most of the time when you see them, all they're doing is pushing the car everywhere because this person doesn't realize there's actually an engine under the hood, and you turn the key, and, it, and, and there's the real power. And you say to yourself this morning, that's silly. No one would ever do that. Maybe not with a car, but we try to do it in the Christian life, don't we? Where, where the real power is not in ourselves, according to Paul, the real power is God's Spirit. And so Paul is praying for these believers that they would experience more of the power of the Spirit of God. But secondly, this morning, he prays they would experience more of the presence of Christ. Now again, these are not two separate things. In many ways, we might say this morning that these are Paul is elaborating or explaining if the power of the Spirit of God is going to be inside of us, he's, he's showing us what this actually looks like. He's, say, he's saying in the second phrase here of our text that Christ, verse 17, may dwell in your hearts through faith. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So he further expands what it means to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in the inner being. He's talking here in this verse about the reality of the indwelling Christ. The first phrase we looked at in verse 16 talked about being strengthened in the inner man. Here it's described as the heart. Essentially, he's saying the same thing. But now the idea, the Spirit of God is verse 16. Now here he's talking about Jesus and the idea of, his, of him dwelling or inhabiting his people. Back in chapter 2, sorry to, to review so much, but back in chapter 2, we discovered that Paul says there that believers, both individually and collectively, are being built together as a dwelling place of God by His Spirit. And so he mentions this idea of dwelling once again here in Ephesians chapter 3. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. This might raise a question as we look at this verse. Uh, a question that might come to mind of some would be, well, doesn't Christ already dwell within the believer? I'm praying that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith, Paul says. Doesn't Jesus already dwell within us? And the answer to that question, of course, is yes. The scripture is clear. The moment a person turns away from sin, that's repentance, the moment, the moment we turn away from a life of sin and we trust in Jesus and call out to him as our Savior, the Bible is very clear that, that through the power of the Spirit, he comes to live inside of us. That he, that he changes us, like we talked about in the first point, from the inside out. He comes inside to make us new. And he, and he doesn't come to, to move inside our lives, as it were, and then to move out. He comes to, to stay, to take up residence. And this happens as a person, again, trusts Jesus. This is a gracious act of God, whereby by God's grace through our faith in him, he comes to live inside of us. So why is Paul praying here? This, this prayer that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith. Well, I think the idea is very simple. I think he's praying Christ already lives within, but I'm praying that Christ would settle down and make your hearts his home. He's already there, but I'm praying that your Christian life would be such that you would enjoy, let me put it this way, deeper fellowship with Jesus. Before Amanda and I were married, uh, we didn't, I was 27, I think, when we got married, and uh, but I was living on my own for, for a while. I was back in my hometown after graduate school, pastoring my home church, and so for a brief time I lived in the church parsonage. And uh, I can remember, as a maybe you can imagine this, as a 27-year-old uh, single man, I had gone out and bought furniture and pictures and other things. You can probably imagine what that looked like, that house inside. It wasn't that inviting. And uh, after Amanda and I were married, uh, as you can imagine, several change were made to, changes were made to the house. I couldn't imagine uh, how some of my stuff didn't make the final cut. Um, but anyway, all the changes were for the better. It looked much more like a home than before. But even then, I can't speak for her, but even then, living in a parsonage, as much as we were thankful for it, it, it never really fully felt like home because it wasn't really ours. 
I mean, nobody was telling us that on a consistent basis, but you just realize that this doesn't really belong to us. Not, a, not too long after we got married, we moved into the house I grew up in uh, for a little bit of time. But, but I still remember that feeling of not feeling like I was quite at home. Have you ever been there before? Where you don't feel really settled? You live in a place but not really settled. That's what Paul is getting at here. Christ dwells inside believers, but he wants to make your life his home. He wants to settle down and be at home in all the rooms. That's what one Christian writer several, several years ago kind of made the comparison here to, from this verse and talking about uh, your heart being like the home of Jesus. And inside your heart, there's all these different rooms, just like your house. And he compared that you know the living room is, is, is the place of fellowship and the kitchen is the place of your desires and the library, if you have a library, I don't know how many uh, uh, homes in Cheatham County have libraries, but your library is, the, is, your, is your mind. And he said basically what Jesus wants to do, he wants to have access to all the rooms. But what Paul is praying here is that we as believers who already have Christ dwelling within us, he wants us to have deeper fellowship with him. To experience fellowship with Jesus. That's what the Christian life is all about. We know this is what Paul is getting at here. That he's talking about a deeper fellowship with Jesus. Because he tells us at the end of this phrase, verse 17. That you, being rooted and grounded in love. May have strength to comprehend with all the saints. What is the breadth and length and height and depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. He's talking about a deeper fellowship. A deeper experience of the love of God in Christ. Now this is a paradox, isn't it? What the Bible brings before us here. Because Paul says, look, I'm praying that you would know something that surpasses knowledge. He talks about the height and length and width and depth. All these spatial dimensions and he's saying look you can't it's like we said you can't measure the power of God it's omnipotent power you can't you can't measure the love of God and so Paul says I'm praying that you would know more of this love that surpasses knowledge listen we cannot know the love of God exhaustively because it's infinite love but we can know it truly you can experience the love of God in your heart in your soul in the inner man it's one thing to know and I'm in full agreement with the song, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. That's the basis of our faith because the Bible tells us that. But it's yet another thing to experience the love of God in your life. You see, we can, we can grow, we can know something of his love, we can know it truly, but we can grow in our comprehension and our enjoyment of God's love. Paul uses two metaphors here in our text, and he says essentially in verse 17, look, um, I want you to be rooted and grounded in this love. In fact, in the order, in the original, love comes first. In love, you see, that's the ground through which our, our faith grows. It's an, ag an agricultural term. That you be rooted in the, in the love of God. Out of the love of God in your life, that's how you, your faith grows. And I want you to be established. That's, that's a building metaphor. Your whole life is built up only as you're firmly established on God's eternal love. As the hymn writer said, could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Paul is praying that these believers would know more of the love of Christ. Listen, brothers and sisters, the Bible is not against experience. Sometimes in churches like ours, because of extremes, we've, we've tended, I'm not blaming Bethel here, I'm just saying sometimes churches like ours, we tend to swing pendulums in opposite directions in an effort to distance ourselves from people whose Christianity is only rooted in experience, not in scripture. We sometimes have shifted to a version of Christianity that's devoid of experience. But the Bible is not against experience at all. That's what Paul is praying here, that these believers would experience more in the inner man of the love of Christ. This love that, that surpasses knowledge. Now remember, this, this experience of, of Christ's love, his presence in our lives, it comes through the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what he's been emphasizing in our text. 
that they would be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. So it's the work of the spirit, but it's also a work that he does in concert with his word. This love of God is known through our interaction with God's word. Our sense of God's love for us in Jesus is not based on our feeling of his love because our feelings can be fickle, but it's based on faith. And where does our faith come from? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So day by day as we interact with the word of God, we learn more of his love. We experience more of his love communicated to us by his precious promises. As his spirit, if I can put it this way, presses those promises home in our hearts. And this is the kind of love that's with us all throughout our lives. Through, through life's ups and downs, through the twists and turns of life, up on the mountaintop and in the deepest and darkest valleys, we have this love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. This is an amazing prayer for us to see this morning. As we start on a new year, as we think about where we are in our own prayer life, Paul is praying for his brothers and sisters to experience more of the power of and presence of Jesus in their lives. To shift to another church, there's a church in the New Testament, you remember this very well in Revelation chapter 3. The church at Laodicea, a church that Jesus, as he gives his assessment of, of the church, it's the total opposite of what they think about themselves, remember? They thought of themselves to be pretty pretty well off. They had, seems like they had a lot of material goods, they were wealthy. They thought of themselves to be pretty self-sufficient. They had things under, under control. But Jesus says, look, it's actually a totally different picture. And remember that they had pushed Jesus essentially outside of the church. Because in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, one of the most moving pictures in all of the Bible, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. Isn't that beautiful? When I, according to the Bible, and we as a church have, has pushed Jesus out of fellowship, the whole purpose, remember, of, of the Christian life is to have living, abiding fellowship with Jesus, the triune God, and we pushed him out of our fellowship. Jesus says, look, I still, I'm going to stand at the door and I'm going to knock. If any man, not just the whole church, if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and dine with him. That's fellowship. And I just tell you, that's exactly what I need. That's exactly what you need. You need real, abiding fellowship with Jesus. You need more of the power of the Spirit of God in your life, and you need more of His, His loving presence. And can I say, as, we try, as I try to bring this to a close, will you pray in this way for yourself? Will you pray in this way for other people in your life? If you commit to praying this way for yourself, if you commit to praying this way for other people in your life, I guarantee you it will change things. To know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. That we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul ends this prayer, as I'll end it this morning, by saying, Now to him who's able to do more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time we've had to gather around your word. Lord, as we think about our own prayers, sometimes they seem to fall so short and they're so weak. So we pray that you would lift our sights uh, on your glory and your grace and that you would help us to come boldly to your throne of grace and there find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. And so, Father, strengthen us by your power. Strengthen us by your spirit. And, Lord, may there be true, living, abiding loving fellowship with Christ in our lives that would flow out to other people. Father, if there's a need in someone's life this morning, meet them at their point of need as we respond now to your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand as we have an invitational song? Number 309. 309, as we stand and sing together. If you need to come forward for prayer for yourself or for someone else, we want to invite you to come as we sing. Without him I could do nothing, without him I'd surely fail, without him I would be drifting like
like a ship without a sail. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him away, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, without him, sing the second verse. I would be. You need to come forward for prayer. Please do that as we sing. Without him, I would be dying. Without him, I'd be enslaved. Without him, life would be hopeless. But with Jesus, Thank God I'm saved. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him away. Oh Jesus, oh Jesus. Without him, how lost I would be. that when you see people come to pray that you begin to pray for their needs we don't have to know their needs God knows but the fact that they come means that they're seeking help and God can provide that so help them by prayer I'm sorry but there are a lot of announcements so please bear with me First of all, I would remind you that the tax receipts for 2022 are available in the vestibule. Brother Barney does a world of work every year to provide those for us. Will you join me in giving him a round of applause? They are uh, in alphabetical order, at least they have been, so please find yours as quickly as you can. There's a baby gift basket for Taylor Ford, her husband. They have a new baby girl, so please remember that. Note, note this, the new there will be a new ladies Bible study on Wednesday evening. It'll be starting in a few weeks. It'll begin on Wednesday, February 8th, and uh, they need to know if you're planning to come. They'll be ordering some books, so there is a sign-up sheet out in the Welcome Center. Please sign up. Our midweek Bible study is growing uh, with great vigor, so I hope you'll become a part of that and let this be the starting point for you ladies. Notice the ladies' visitation. 
will start back on Tuesday, February 7th at 1 o'clock. You can see Betsy Bowman. Men's visitation will start this week. When I read that, I, I felt like it's sort of like the church is shaking itself and saying, let's get with it again. And I'm so glad. Appreciate you ladies and also all of the men who are taking part in this. So please keep this in prayer. There will be a men's prayer breakfast on the 28th of this month at 8 o'clock. So uh, men, please remember that. We'll be announcing it again. I'll be beginning a biblical parenting course in two weeks on the 22nd, and we meet up in the old sanctuary. I've been teaching this, these two courses on the family for 40 straight years. So I think I may get it right this time. <laughs> I may get it right this time, so if you're raising children, you'd like to join. Typically, it takes about a year to go through the book, so we invite you to come. And then, of course, you're welcome to go back to your regular Sunday school class. Um, please remember the change in service times that Brother Barry mentioned. This will begin two weeks from today on the 22nd. The services will begin with Sunday school at 9.30 and worship at 10.30. That's two weeks from today. Finally, Brother Barron mentioned the lock-in in which one young man gave his heart to the Lord. Donna and I got a report on the lock-in uh, after it had finished shortly and we sat there and rejoiced I told someone that I think Donna experienced revival <laughs> just hearing about all the good things that had happened here's the thing I want to leave with you I'm thankful for all of those adults who helped in this but I want to mention that everyone who has given to help provide the Family Life Center or who has prayed on behalf of our youth program shares in the spiritual victory that is in this young man's life who was one to the Lord. So you are part of it. Thank God for that. I feel pretty good today. Have you figured that out? I hope you have. Let's stand together. Father, we're so grateful for all the blessings you have given us. Help us, Lord, that we will be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we will come to know greater riches in Christ and our fellowship with him. Be with us now in the Sunday school hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.